It's wonderful to be here today. I'm, uh, my name is Josh Gladstone. I'm here on behalf of Northern Public Affairs Magazine um, and my colleagues Gerald Sabin and Sheena Kennedy who are co-publishers uh, at Northern Public Affairs. So I'm very happy to be here today. I'm also a little bit surprised to be honest uh, to be with uh, in this forum I guess as a publisher of a magazine rather than as a researcher which is actually what my my job is researching and I do work on resource development but I'm actually here to talk about uh, a side project that uh, began at Cernoka a couple of years ago that has taken on a life of its own and now I'm here talking about magazines which is a surprise to me and also a really um, wonderful thing I think. So uh, next slide please. <coughs> So I guess the, the best way to start, I'd, I'd like to talk about the role of Northern Public Affairs in knowledge exchange uh, in the North, and that's, that's my plan. Uh, but I think it would be helpful to give you a bit of, some, a bit of background on the publication. Um, Northern Public Affairs began uh, about, well, it was November, uh, 2011 at the Cernoka conference and I think it all goes back to Paul Martin doesn't it with the funding that he had for uh, social economy research that carried through beyond his mandate uh, and the social economy research network in northern Canada was one of the nodes in this this network and of course RESDA now is is the continuation uh, of some of that work um, but under the Cernoka uh, mandate, we had a, a workshop back in 2011 in November, and the workshop brought together community members, uh, people from social economy organizations, and researchers. Uh, and I remember sitting at a table at the final breakout session for Cernoka. Uh, Mary Ellen was there. Uh, my other colleagues, Sheena and Jerry, were there, uh, and we were talking about. Uh, what could be done to transmit some of the knowledge that had been gained through these partnerships to decision makers. And uh, I think Mary Ellen had the idea for a sort of an ongoing, some kind of an ongoing newsletter that could be used by researchers across the territories to uh, communicate the, the knowledge that they had gained through, through their research to decision makers. And we went away from that thinking about what, what could what could be done, what could we do, what kind of a model might work. And uh, we came back with a proposal to start a sort of a, a, a public affairs magazine for, for Northern Canada. Um, so <laughs> I, think, I think Mary Ellen said that uh, you can't say nothing ever came out of a breakout session. Uh, and I think, I think that proved true in this case anyway. Um, so that's, that's the origin of the the magazine, that's, that began our mandate. So ne next slide, please. Northern Public Affairs began uh, as sort of a, a magazine that was intended to um, foster knowledge exchange between researchers, policymakers, and, and an engaged public. Uh, we started as, we started a non nonprofit uh, organization. Um, we have a network of advisors and editors, uh, collaborators and funders that we've developed over the last couple of years. Um, we've developed a print and an online magazine. I'm focusing here on print and I think at this point where uh, most of the work we do focuses on, on print and publishing, publishing these magazines you'll see at the back and if anybody wants to pick one up you're more than welcome. Um, and we're also, we're on the way to becoming uh, a charitable organization with an educational mandate. So in the last two years, we've, we've made quite a bit of progress. We work as a sort of an informal volunteer run organization that is really trying to create, um, to create a, a network of people who are interested in um, thinking about the kind of policy, uh, policy work the policy issues that um, are facing Northerners and filling a gap in uh, what we saw to be a, a, a lack of communication first between researchers and policymakers in the end, a, a forum in which uh, different uh, research projects and researchers could 
take their research and um, and write it, I guess, uh, present it in a way that was digestible by people who are in positions to to make decisions based on it. This is a, uh, it's, it, anyway, next slide, please. Um, so the, what we've done, there, there are a couple of ways that we work to, uh, to bring research to the attention of, uh, of policymakers. Um, we, uh, we work with researchers to publish feature articles in the magazine. Um, we've worked with political scientists, political economists, economists on issues such as poverty, um, on questions about research uh, and research in the north. Uh, we have an issue coming out on literacy and we have someone, uh, a researcher writing on uh, literacy in the north. Um, so feature articles are one way that people can contribute to the magazine. Um, research notes is another feature of the magazine that we have started to allow researchers to present uh, small summaries of the research that they're doing uh, to, uh, I guess, in the magazine. Uh, could also be used to communicate with communities uh, to the extent that uh, communities are, are engaged in, in the magazine, and I'll, I'll get into that in a second. We publish themed issues, so we've published now four themed issues of the magazine. Um, one on treaties, one on research, um, one on the conservative vision for the North, which came out last fall. Uh, the l most recent issue is on the Arctic Council, and the issue coming up is on, is on literacy. So each issue has a theme, and we develop articles around the theme, and then we accept other articles um, from people who are interested in contributing on, on whatever other topic. Um, and so you end up getting a, a diversity of, of, I guess, of, of articles and topics within any given issue. Um, and we've also started uh, to publish special issues. So one way that we've worked with uh, the research community is by publishing issues based on conferences. Last year in November there was a Northern Governance and Economy Conference, Stephanie Robacher Fox was w one of the co-chairs. Uh, and based on that conference, we took a number of presentations, uh, speeches, and uh, writing, I guess, editorials by the co-chairs, and turned that into an issue of the magazine that presented um, a, an overview of the conference and gave conference organizers an opportunity to um, bring their material together and um, first keep it in one place, which is uh, one, one important part of what we do uh, permanently, um, but also sort of go over the material and think about ways that, um, that the material itself might be useful for policy makers. Um, so special issues, we, we have another special issue coming up on, uh, on Inuit education. That should be coming out sometime in winter. And we're working in partnership with the Amayuk, uh, the Amayuk uh, Inuit Education Center at ITK. So um, those are different ways that researchers can, uh, can engage with us and engage with the magazine. Um, but our mandate has broadened beyond, uh, beyond working specifically with researchers. If you could go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, we realized as we were sitting uh, at the table and as we developed the proposal for Northern Public Affairs that, um, that the mandate that we have, uh, that the, the, the kinds of, uh, the kind of gap that we're looking at is broader than a gap between uh, researchers and, and policy makers. Um, we think and we, we're working on the, uh, what motivates us is bringing uh, in-depth analysis to northern public affairs issues. And we, do, we try and do this from a northern perspective. We've put together an advisory board uh, of, um, of people from across the north. The northern research institutes have been uh, incredibly helpful and supportive in putting this together. Um, and Mary Ellen now sits on, on the advisory board representing the Northern Institutes. Um, we have people from, uh, I guess Val has also sat on the board. 
uh, from the Yukon. Um, the advisory board helps us by um, providing us with a, a vetting forum for, uh, for issues that we, that we face in terms of balance, in terms of diversity of voice, uh, questions of uh, some editorial policy questions that come up from time to time. Uh, and they provide us with uh, links to, uh, to communities of interest in the north and help us bring material into the magazine. So the advisory board has really helped us to, uh, to fulfill the mandate that we set for ourselves. Um, and the, I guess the, the mandate seems to be, the feedback that we've gotten so far has been uh, qu quite positive and the, I guess the exchange of information that we're talking about um, has, has worked to the point where I've been to, uh, to communities and shown the magazine to people that I know and somebody, uh, was, somebody actually looked at the magazine and said, oh, this, this is my cabin. And this was Gwen Healy's piece, I guess, uh, a couple of issues ago where she had written on some of the work that she was doing with, with the center. Um, and that was a, this is a way that it seems that people's, people are relating to the magazine in ways that we hadn't, uh, hadn't entirely expected, but it's, it, it's, uh, it's been quite positive. Um, so the question of, of what is a, a northern perspective and how we can bring a northern perspective to issues uh, is, is the issue that we're, we're facing, I think, most of the time as we're developing content for the magazine. Um, we all understand how complex uh, and rich Northern society is and how uh, Northern people are navigating language, ethnicity, age, uh, religion, history, family, socioeconomic status. Um, and we needed to find a way to bring these different viewpoints together into the magazine, knowing that it would take some creativity on our part to do that. So um, we, we also know that in any society, voices can be and are marginalized. And one of, the, uh, one of our focuses is to try and ensure that we gain a real diversity of voice in the magazine. So we don't want to just hear from, uh, from policymakers themselves or researchers, we want to um, gain multiple perspectives on the issues that we think and that other that that we hear through our networks are are important to people. So how do we do this? Um, well, we first we rely on the strength of our mandate. Uh, it's a it's a public mandate, uh, and the interest and goodwill of of our audience to provide material and, and content for us. We work on a model. We don't pay for material. Um, we uh, we hope that the value, people see the value of, of the publication and um, believe that there's enough value to, to contribute. And so far we've been quite successful, I think, bringing, um, bringing people in that way to, to write for us. And it's yielded some absolutely wonderful, uh, wonderful content. Um, I'll, I'll just speak very briefly to an article that came out in the, the, not the last issue, the issue before by Avia Johnson, which uh, was called My Mother's Tongue. It was a, a piece on uh, identity and, uh, and language, but it was also a critique of Nunavut's education system. And I don't know if people have, have read that article, but it, it was an absolutely astounding piece that came out of uh, a young woman who's now at, uh, at U of O. She's at, she was at NS, Nunavut, Sivinik, Sivut at the time. Um, and it was one of those articles that uh, we realized at the time that there was a, a there's a wealth of, uh, of information, of knowledge, of perspective, of voice out there, uh, and of really thoughtful, um, cri con constructive critique uh, of uh, of the status quo that doesn't uh, that that needs an outlet, and so we're working to try and create that outlet for people. Um, we the approach that we're taking, which is to um, to bring bring content in through sort of volunteerism, 
um, is also, it also has some limitations. One of those limitations is uh, that the people who are able to contribute are the people, I mean, this is, this is a print publication, so the people that contribute are the people who have the time, the inclination, uh, and the resources to do this in their spare time. Um, and that, uh, that creates some limitations for us uh, and for the magazine. And what we're, we're trying to overcome that in a number of ways. One way is by seeing our board, our editorial board, as a resource for authors. So we work, uh, we work very hard to make sure that the material that comes in is published, that we're able to work with the authors over a long period of time to uh, develop their articles and offer whatever we can to make sure that the perspective that somebody wants to bring to an issue uh, is, is, presented, uh, is presented well. Um, and we, um, we also have taken an approach that, you know, fully, fully formed articles might not come in, but people still have um, important perspectives to bring to bear on public issues. So we, uh, we host interviews, we publish conversations, uh, we publish speeches, we publish uh, material from legislatures, um, we publish poetry, and we see this as bringing uh, the widest possible diversity to, uh, to, the, uh, to the issues that we, that we present to the magazine. Um, and so we're also constantly trying to reimagine the way that we can bring diversity and voice into the magazine. Um, we are beginning to think through ways of um, providing an, sort of a, a, a recognition to people of the work that they're doing. We're never, we're never going to be able to pay uh, our authors, uh, you know, going professional rates for material. Um, but if there are ways that we can um, support people who might not otherwise be able to publish by providing small sums of money, we're thinking of, of ways to do that, some sort of a Northern Writers Fund on, on policy issues. Um, so uh, hopefully there's more to come on that. Um, but we are always, we're always looking for people with, um, with different perspectives, different voices, um, and, uh, and a keen interest in, in policy issues to, to write for us and, uh, and bring forward their views. So, uh, that, if you go to the, not next slide, the slide after. Um, just some very, some very brief thoughts on print. Um, print is an old medium, and uh, in this new age, the digital turn, and the way that people are now using social media all over the world, uh, including, including all over the north, um, it might seem a bit odd that we decided to uh, begin with a print magazine, um, but there are some, there are some, I think there's some really good reasons uh, to do that, and it seems to be working for us uh, to this point. One of the things that we thought was really important as we were getting started was that we, we wanted this to become a journal of record. Um, we wanted to collect, uh, collect analysis um, and, uh, and perspective and put it in a place where people could, uh, to which people could return over and over if they wanted to. Um, and as we're publishing speeches and, uh, and material from the leg legislatures uh, and these wonderful, wonderful pieces that come in, it's important to us that the magazine is, is housed somewhere and that people can continue to come back to it. So the fact that it's in print uh, it's now in, the magazine is now in libraries across the country, uh, university libraries, legislative libraries. Um, we are sending the magazine through the Northern Research Institutes, which have been major supporters of, of the initiative. Uh, the magazines are now finding their way into uh, Northern Learning Centers, into Hamlets, into uh, MPs' offices, into Aboriginal organizations across the North. <coughs> Um, they're finding their way into coffee tables, and uh, the reading the reading is a bit dense, but it's uh, a, a re I, we think it's an important record of of events and uh, and debate in the north that um, until this point hasn't been in one place. So um, I think th I think that's a, that's been a success for us uh, for in terms of the print medium. Um, 
it's also, print is also a really personal medium. And so people are, people who use the material, I've heard that people have used some of the articles in, in classes, uh, both up north and down south. Um, and so you, people who are, are reading this material are engaged in a personal level, at a personal level with the material that we're, we're presenting. And, um, and the, kind of, the kind of engagement that that engenders, I think, is really important for, um, for learning. So the, the literacy issue of the magazine is um, sort of a way that we're able to, to talk about how that might, that might be working. Um, and so there are a few other there are a few other reasons that I thought print was was important, um, and we can but some of that's a little theoretical. But um, and Marshall I took some of it from Marshall McLuhan, which I, I find interesting. Um, but I think at this point, probably to close, what I'll do is say that um, we're we've published a number of, of uh, issues now. We haven't touched on the resource development theme yet. Um, if there is interest in um, taking some of the uh, material that you're doing as researchers, as community members on the resource development theme, uh, and including that in the publication, we would be happy to entertain ideas. Also, the, the question of someone was chatting with me last night, and the question came up about uh, an issue on knowledge exchange. And I think that would be also something we'd be very interested in talking about. But um, there's a lot of material out there. There's a, there are, are many discussions going on. Um, and to have them in one place and have people be able to refer back to it, um, I think is probably could be a useful thing for people. So that's, that's what we do. Um, and if people have questions about it, feel free to come and find me a little bit later. There are, again, there are magazines at the back for you to take home. Thank you.